is my Navy gun. Uh, is there what? Is my Navy gun. And I'm excited about it. And when I say excited, I mean it. Not that much. Friday's Air Force. Yeah. Well, I guess that's fine. Say that there's nothing wrong with the Navy gun. Yeah. Well, you're interested with me. How are you? All good right. Good. How are you? It's good to see you. Good to see you. Well, it's the days when I have to be at the Navy Club. So uh, Doug Bush is out of the office. And so it's like, hey, can you fill in? Like, <laughs> yeah. You need them gray and name nothing first, right? Isn't that how that yeah. works? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how are things doing? Interesting. Yeah? Good. How long have you been out here? This month, I was out 17 weeks. Yeah, so you've been sort of at a flip of the switch. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I think on some level it's terrific, right? And it's somehow it's terrific for me to survive that, but it may not be as good an end to the two of you would think. It's still up here because we, we figured out that way. It's not the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> no, I figured out that Miles was qualified for now. Right. He didn't get it just because what else? He didn't get rated a minimum wage. I did the hearing this month. Oh, fine. Well, it's a new nonprofit. I mean, yeah. and so I know it's pretty much what they expect of us. About two hours in. Come on, come on, come on, Joe. I think you better just get some rest, right? It doesn't all come in there right after a while. No, I know, but you just can't do this. Seems like all the equipment is stolen. Um. Can you, can, you, yeah, can you fill in? We'll go Starry Bus for this week. I hope a couple yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah. 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 Most of it's got to Yeah, I think they might show it. Yeah, well, you know, no, because they've been uh, preparing all night. Yeah. 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 I'm sure they're going to come out of the summer whenever the last of those yeah. 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 Sit back. I don't know what the rest of us are going to drive on. We got to that ship and then went abroad. That's one thing that I learned at the States. Yeah. 
Well, I want to welcome all of our members and our distinguished panel of experts for today's hearing focused on the fiscal year 2015 budget request. We have testifying before us retired Admiral Robert Natter, former commander of Fleet Forces Command, and Dr. Rebecca Grant, our IS independent research. Thank you both for appearing today to share your unique perspectives on this important topic. Before I begin a specific discussion about the fiscal year 2015 budget request, I want to express my continued concern about our overall defense budget request and proposed defense spending trends. To put it bluntly, the President's budget greatly diminishes our ability for responding to emergent, emerging threats and decreases our current readiness. The harm in our budget deliberations will not be measured on the impact to our force structure today, but rather the greatest impact will be the debilitating impact of the continued underfunding of the defense strategy and our hampered ability to respond to future global security requirements and challenges. As for the budget request, there are multiple issues I find concerning. The most perplexing issue is the perceived indifference to the aircraft carrier force structure. The budget request supports the defueling of the USS George Washington, but has not included required funds for the refueling. This $450 million deficit in fiscal year 2015 may lead to a reduction in the overall aircraft carrier fleet from 11 to 10. Equally problematic is the proposal to not support $300 million in advance procurement for additional nuclear reactor cores in fiscal year 2015. I refuse to accept the current trajectory that reduces our aircraft carrier fleet to 10. This runs in contravention to the entirety of the global requirements set forth by our combatant commanders. When asked about the ability to support the global presence demand, Admiral Locklear indicated that even the current aircraft carrier fleet was insufficient to adequately support requirements. I'm also concerned about the national capabilities of the industrial base and the potential negative consequences that threaten to induce greater instability to what already exists. Considering the recent closure of Avondale Shipyard in Louisiana, I'm concerned that a diminished workload will precipitate additional restructuring. With the truncation of the DDG-1000 program, the procurement reduction associated with the littorial combat ship, the potential elimination of an aircraft carrier refueling and complex overhaul, and the indecision associated with additional amphibious ships after delivery of LPD-27, all of these issues will negatively impact the ship construction industry. Unless we are able to turn the overall defense trend lines in a positive direction, including the shipbuilding budget, I'm concerned that the Navy will be unable to sustain the entirety of the existing industrial base. Regarding future Air Force capabilities, I'm pleased that the Air Force was able to protect its new KC-46 tanker and the new long-range strike bomber. These two programs will be critical to our nation's ability to project power for decades to come. However, it wasn't without cost or consequence to other imperative Air Force programs in capability areas such as space, airlift, tactical fighters, and necessary modernization and upgrade programs that bridge the uh, capability gap until the Air Force's top three acquisition priorities are fielded. I look forward to discussing these important topics with our expert of pan panel of witnesses. And with that, I turn to my good friend and colleague, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mike McIntyre. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this hearing. Thank you to our guests for being here with us today. Uh, as you may well know, our full committee has heard from the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations about the Navy's budget request coming up. And with regard to the Air Force, we'll look forward to hearing from the Secretary of the Air Force and the Air Force Chief of Staff on Friday. When we consider uh, the proposals before us this afternoon, I know there's some questions that I, too, am concerned about, just as my good friend uh, Chairman Forbes has indicated. The Navy appears to have done better than other services in terms of protecting top budget priorities, but there's still, of course, many challenges over the horizon. The future of our aircraft carrier force, the size of the future amphibious assault ship force, and the Ohio submarine replacement program, something that I was discussing this morning in our other larger committee hearing. Uh, given the Navy's budget projections, can, can all of these challenges be met with the aircraft carrier force, the amphibious assault ship force, and the Ohio submarine replacement program? For the Air Force, I'm pleased it was able to protect the new bomber program in the KC-46 tanker. However, the Air Force is taking risk in other areas, including retiring more C-130s, especially those at Pope Army Airfield in North Carolina. Uh, which is located at Fort Bragg, and a large number of the older tactical fighter and reconnaissance aircraft. 
Uh, with regard to the 440th, I, I want to particularly cite an article that appeared in the statewide newspaper, the Raleigh News and Observer, just yesterday. With regard to the 440th Airlift Wing's medical training flight that they described, uh, and their references, of course, in, t in this article talking about the proposal with the Air Force being proposed before Congress to deactivate the 440th Airlift Wing at Pope Army Airfield, uh, which would send 11 of the C-130s to other bases. Uh, as this states, the 440th has provided airlift, airdrop, and medical support from Fort Bragg and Fayetteville and all of the airmen training Monday of this week have been deployed overseas at least once. Last year, the 440th moved more than 500,000 pounds of cargo, 3,400 passengers, and 13,000 paratroopers, working with a combination of both active duty and reserve personnel. Uh, we know that uh, with the expansion at Fort Bragg uh, under the last BRAC proceedings and the large investment that this Congress has made at Fort Bragg, uh, it seems very, very uh, unfortunate, and we feel like very unwise to suddenly pull out the very support group uh, with the Air Force that helps the mission at Fort Bragg be carried forward. Uh, I would hope to hear the witnesses' thoughts on these types of topics. Also, we know that the DOD has chosen to focus on potential conflicts where our Navy and Air Force will lead in terms of providing rapid response and combat power, yet at the same time, there's a proposal to reduce the size of the Army up to 150,000 troops by 2019. Uh, when we consider sequestration and all the concerns that go with it, uh, the concern is, will the savings that are supposed to result from those reductions in the Army, uh, would be, they be properly reinvested in Navy and Air Force capabilities, or would it just be money to help sustain what the Navy and Air Force need to continue? Uh, the question is, are we going to be able to plan for the next generation technologies as well. And I'd like to hear your witnesses' thoughts with regard to what the Navy and Air Force are pursuing in this budget request, if those right, are the right technologies for us to continue to focus on. In other words, are we correct in investing heavily in cyber, unmanned systems, directed energy, and electronic warfare programs? Are they going to be able to be sustained uh, with the work that needs to be done for us to plan properly and adequately for the future for our national security and for helping our men and women in uniform do the work that they've committed to do. With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and we look forward to today's testimony. Mike, thank you, and um, I think all the members have the biographies for both of our distinguished witness, witnesses uh, today, and we appreciate both of you being here. We appreciate the written testimony that you've already given to us, which is going to be made a part of the record without objection. And now, Admiral, we look forward to any remarks that you might want to offer to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking uh, Member McIntyre. Uh, I, uh, it is my pleasure to appear before you all today. I'm honored to be able to offer my independent assessment of the FY15 budget, especially as it pertains to the Navy and Naval Forces. First and foremost, I'm very thankful for having had the opportunity to serve my country, 36 years of commissioned service in the Navy and one year enlisted service. Uh, and my wife and I are very proud that our three daughters chose to serve this country as part of the Navy, two still serving. And I can assure you that they provide, as do their friends, a very blunt, straightforward assessment of their views and their generation's uh, perspective on our military. Today, our country enjoys a superior military force. Thank you to our citizens, who have made the necessary sacrifices in succeeding generations to make that possible, especially as on behalf of the representatives and succeeding administrations who have represented our people. The leadership and national will to invest in ensuring that this country has the best military possible has resulted in unparalleled quality shipbuilding and aircraft manufacturing. Anyone has to just look around the world to see the competition and know that that's the case. It's representative of dedicated and talented youth who man our ships and aircraft. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the undersung heroes who work in our ship repair facilities, shipyards, and aircraft uh, manufacturing facilities around this great country of ours. We've been through a decade, more than a decade, of continuous war footing in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
and elsewhere overseas. With the anticipated uh, withdrawal of our forces in Afghanistan, it's obvious that this country and our elected representatives have chosen to retrench as a military, but not hopefully as a nation. And as this committee is well aware, the United States Navy is certainly not retrenching. We are continuing to operate and deploy uh, around the world at the same levels as our forces had to do prior to OEF and OIF. And that's with a significant reduction in the numbers of ships, crews, and aircraft that we enjoyed during that period. The result is, of course, running ships, wearing our aircraft down, and extending deployments of our men and women on our ships at sea. Needless to say, our nation and the Joint Forces Commanders will continue to rely on the Navy and the Marine Corps and all our services to be able to respond to a range of military operations worldwide. Needless to say, we're an international uh, trading community today, this country, and a lot of other of our allies. They depend on freedom of the seas to move uh, markets to and from this country and around the world. And without the confidence of our allies and trading partners in our ability to keep those sea routes open and free, our economy and our markets would be affected negatively. We obviously have to prepare for the various contingency risks around the world. And in that regard, I agree wholeheartedly with the CNO's assessment that the Navy will be at high risk and not able to prevail in all warfare areas against a near peer force. And let me be specific about that. He's talking about China and Russia. Make no mistake about that. They're near peer force, and we would be at risk with the funding and with the forces that we have uh, available to us now and in the future. The challenge facing the U.S. Navy is budgetary uncertainty in the near term and a threat of the return to the potentially disastrous sequestration funding levels after 2015. Essentially, if we go back to the BCA funding levels, the Navy will not be able to uh, provide the force levels, the readiness levels that uh, have been projected and provided to you in this morning's hearing. I think the CNO has made the case for that, and I fully agree with that. The big elephant at the door was mentioned by uh, Congressman McIntyre. That's the Ohio replacement. That replacement is going to require such a huge chunk of our SCN funding that our industrial base and the ships that we're able to deploy uh, in the future is not going to be worth the paper it's written on. Unless there's external funding made available for the Ohio class replacement, our SCN line and the ships that we're able to uh, project out into the future are not going to be in accordance with the 30-year shipbuilding plan that you have seen. Aircraft uh, will also be affected if we uh, return to the funding that we're talking about with 111 fewer aircraft procured in the fit-up. Uh, we obviously, I agree with the uh, Secretary and the CNO, that we're going to have to rein in the significant growth of medical expenses, housing stipends, and subsistence payments for our people. And retirement remuneration and co-pays ought to be part of that reassessment. Having said that, the military makes up 1% of this nation's population today. And I believe that those kinds of adjustments need to be made across the board. There needs to be shared sacrifice in our society and not just sacrifice on the part of our men and women in uniform. The people with whom I've spoken on active duty today are willing to step up. They understand the budget constraints of this nation, and they're willing to sacrifice. They'd like to be doing it with the rest of our nation and not all alone. Lastly, let me just say that I've uh, discussed not only with the junior uh, people in the Navy, but also our leadership, and I'm quite frankly dismayed and disappointed by the repeated reports of untoward behavior to include violent sexual assaults and significant shortcomings on the part of some of our military leaders. My discussion with the CNO and our other senior leaders is that they need to be held accountable 
the letter of the law needs to be upheld and the rest of our people need to know that that's not going to be allowed and permitted in this Navy today. Uh, with that, sir, I'd like to uh, uh, conclude my remarks. Thank you, Admiral. Dr. Grant? Thank you, uh, first of all, for the opportunity to testify. I'm glad that the committee today is looking for some independent assessments because I think the committee has um, a special responsibility to look at the fiscal year 2015 defense budget in light of the changes in the international security environment. As we see daily, we are not in the world of five years ago where stability operations in Iraq and Afghanistan were our top concerns. What we see today are signals of instability ranging from the East China Sea to the Crimea. I will uh, confine my remarks primarily to those Air Force systems that are key to uh, projection of forces. Uh, and as we know, Americans have long counted on air superiority to make all other forms of military force most efficient and most effective. And in looking across this budget, I see that we uh, have an opportunity to consider whether we can really take some steps to diminish risk and produce a budget that better meets our national security needs. Specifically for me, my number one concern is that we prepare and posture and equip for a strong deterrent stance in the Pacific. Specifically, this means being able to retain air superiority and sea superiority and that freedom of maneuver, even if forces of China or another adversary, potential adversary, adopt a confrontational stance. Uh, China's not the only major power in the Pacific uh, nor around the world, but if we prepare for a strong deterrent posture there, then we get our capability right for most of our global needs. Freedom of action in the Pacific demands some highly sophisticated air forces that can operate with impunity on an arc from Australia to the Aleutians. And so looking across this budget, I have a few uh, specific concerns. I'm glad to say I think the Air Force has it largely right in its top three priorities uh, with, of F-35, KC-46, and the long-range strike bomber. Although it's outside the scope of this committee, let me just say very briefly about F-35 that that too is part of power projection for our joint forces and is very important to continue to procure and to increase procurement rates to give us a solid capability with a fifth gen system. KC-46, I'm glad to see, is proceeding on course. Without tankers, we do not have global air power. In fact, we really do not have global military power. And of course, the new stealth bomber is rightly a top priority. Why? Because there is no other system in the inventory of our partner services or of our allies that can provide that rapid, precise strike capability against some of potentially the most dangerous targets with the greatest possibility to threaten the international security system. We are already short in our bomber force and it's old as the committee well knows. We need to go ahead and procure. That said, there are three issues that I think the committee might want to think of going forward on the bomber. The first of these is, uh, in my personal opinion, overclassification. And this can be a risk not only to the proper public debate about such a major acquisition, but overclassification of a program can also restrict the technical work and cross flow that the prime contractors must go through to produce an adequate system. We know that there will be systems on that bomber that should always remain highly classified, but I think the committee might want to reconsider the stance on whether this program should remain in the black. In my opinion, it should not. Second, is the technology scope right for this bomber? We want to keep the costs controlled but we also want to have a bomber that's right for a 40-year service life, a period of time in which we may see the addition of new electronic countermeasures, directed energy weapons, hypersonic missiles, many technologies that require the space, power, appropriate engines, and cooling to make this possible going forward. Third is quantity. Even back in Desert Storm in 1991, we deployed 66 bombers. So 80 to 100 is on the short end of what we'll need. We may want to consider going for more in the end. Uh, finally, I want to make some remarks about the industrial base. In the 1950s, we had 54 major aircraft program starts across the fixed wing inventory for the Air Force and the Navy. In the decade of the 2000s, we had just nine. What that means most of all is that the key of our industrial base, which is people, 
are finding it more difficult to gain the experience across multiple programs. Going forward, what we need in the industrial base really are four things. We need qualified tier one suppliers. We need critical design skills preserved within the design teams, everything from pyrotechnics for the cockpit onto structures, et cetera. Uh, we need to have program managers who are experienced across a range of programs and able to execute from design right through the end of the life cycle. And finally, we need to have that robust series of starts and particularly a focus on advanced engine technology, which in the end is what often separates our Air Force from its peer competitors. With that, I'd like to close my uh, opening statement and I look forward to your questions. Thank you again for the opportunity. Dr. Grant, thank you so much. And um, to, to both of you, if we were uh, talking about an athletic event and we were walking in here today and we were talking about athletic teams, we would, and this were the gymnasium, we'd look around and we'd have all these wonderful banners about what our military has done. We'd look at the team on the floor and we'd say, Admiral, kind of as you did, they're the best in the world. Um, but for both of you, looking at the budgets that have been set forth here and projecting out uh, five years or ten years down the road, what's the part of it that gives you the greatest heartburn as to what you see? Because, um, Admiral, you've you've had to meet those demands before you know what it's like, and, uh, Doctor, you've, you're looking at that industrial base every day and watching it wither away. What, what concerns you most about what you're seeing? Well, I think it's blatantly obvious that our uh, investment accounts in our military are on the downslope and uh, nations like uh, China and Russia, their investment accounts are on the upslope. So there is gonna, meeting, gonna be a meeting of those slopes. In real terms, what that means to us is that we're deploying our ships uh, more frequently than we did even before OIF and OEF when the rule was essentially uh, six month deployments. Today, it's not uncommon to have seven and eight month deployments and the new fleet response plan that is presented, which I think is a good one given the assets that we have, is gonna result in eight or nine month deployments. But the more those assets are used and flowed forward so that eight and nine months become the rule, then the exception is gonna pretty quickly come to a year. Uh, and with that, people are not gonna stay with us and our ships and aircraft are gonna get worn out. We saw that in an era between Vietnam and between 9-11, uh, when we actually had to tie up ships alongside the pier. Many of you remember that. And investments and readiness eventually turned that around, but we don't want to go there again. So to me, it's blatantly obvious what's happening here. Uh, and the number of force levels are going down, but the demands on those force levels are remaining constant. And in the case of the Pacific, probably going up. Dr. Grant? I agree, and I would say there are two things that concern me. The number one concern is we are, um, certainly within the Air Force, developing advanced aircraft, but not procuring them in quantities sufficient to meet the threats that are on the very near-term horizon. We are not procuring new fighters quickly enough, and although we have a bomber program now, you will recall this is a program that has started in an embryonic way, stopped and restarted, and we are already late to need in the procurement for long range strike. So I'm concerned that we are not modernizing our combat air forces quickly enough and substantially enough. A secondary and related concern goes to uh, the readiness and training. The effects of sequestration have made a dent in the training of the long-term force and those younger aviators who have missed uh, certain training evolutions that force simply cannot get back. If we continue to oscillate in our funding of flying hours, we may impose long-term quality shortfalls on the U.S. Air Force that really would be unacceptable. And, <clears throat> Doctor, when you talk about the risk of not modernizing, we hear that phrase a lot, but what does that mean? What, is ri what kind of risk are we assuming? We are not buying enough aircraft to 
face down and deter a potential peer adversary in the Pacific. Let me be specific. We are not buying enough aircraft to overmatch China in the Pacific. So um, we had testimony in this subcommittee by Admiral Lehman and uh, Gary Ruffhead probably a year or so ago where they talked about a tipping point where the United States, as we continue to drop our um, military spending, it would actually encourage um, peer competitors to start increasing theirs to catch us. They felt we were already there. Um, it, what do you feel about that? If only we really knew. But I would have to agree. We are close to being, we are too close to feel comfortable with where we are. I think our, um, we are just now beginning to focus on preparing for that theater. We need to focus on it very sharply because we want to deter. And to deter means we cannot allow, allow a gap to open up in our capabilities. I do not think that our competition with China is like our former competition with the former Soviet Union, where it was a case of matching forces one for one. China has natural advantages in geography. We need a force big enough and strong enough to make sure that China doesn't feel comfortable taking risks and pushing out in that theater. And in that case, I think we are far too close to the tipping point to be comfortable. Admiral, you have had to meet these needs of our combatant commanders uh, before. Um, we are hearing a lot today about perhaps reducing the number of carriers down from 11 to 10. Could you just give us your thoughts on how crucial it is to have those 11 carriers, or if you think it is crucial? And secondly, um, in the area of munitions, how, how crucial is that, and where do you see us with this budget? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, as you know, the commander of Pacific Command has testified on the requirement for carriers in his theater. Uh, I can assure you that the commander of Central Command will also echo that requirement. There's certainly not enough carriers to satisfy uh, the demands of all our com combatant commanders. They've all testified to that point. The issue and the quandary is how many are enough? And unfortunately, we really can't say the answer to that question until post hostilities. Having said that, every one of our combatant commanders have testified, and certainly the Chief of Naval Operations has testified, that 11 is just barely sufficient to satisfy the need, and it doesn't fully satisfy the need of all the combatant commanders. So going from 11 to 10 and eliminating a, a capital ship like this halfway through its life is irresponsible on the part of our citizens. And I think if our citizens had the vote on this and they knew what the trade-offs were, that they would ensure that this national asset were funded. Uh, the aircraft that go with it, uh, the ability to project power, and the ability to prevent the kinds of action that Dr. Grant was referring to out in the Pacific Theater are important. And so, the fact that we are talking about going to uh, 10 carriers and the ability to flow far fewer assets than we have been able to in the past puts us at greater risk. The CNO has testified that against a peer competitor, two mission areas are at high risk. I think the, uh, the slope of that curve is obvious. And if both of you could just address your worry, if any, on munitions. Uh, on munitions, uh, w there is a requirement for more advanced munitions and on the part of the Navy, a better surface-to-surface -surface capability. I know the commander of uh, Pacific Command uh, is well aware of that. We've had discussions about that. The Navy is uh, investing in that. The uh, depth of our munitions is an issue. We're okay in some areas. We're, we need more in the way of more precision and uh, uh, more highly capable uh, munitions. And of course, a lot of that is dependent upon the threat and the potential adversary. But I think against the high end, there's no doubt that we need uh, greater investment in munitions. Dr. Grant, your thoughts? 
I agree. Uh, we probably have enough Mark 83 bomb bodies in the inventory, but I doubt we have enough of much of anything else across the spectrum. We see in every conflict a shortage of some type of crucial munition. In um, the, the Kosovo conflict of 1999, it was a shortage of JDAMs, and they had to be rushed through production. This happens to us every time. The difference in a peer conflict will be that we won't have the luxury of time to uh, spin up production lines, rush munitions, trade them between theaters, move them between ships, move them from ships to air bases and air bases to ships. We need to have in place in theater a wide range of munitions, the correct air-to-air -air munitions. We need to have, uh, if we may count them as such, munitions such as THAAD and Patriot. These need to be where they need to be before the crisis starts. That is crucial to giving our policymakers options as we face a potential peer competitor. Uh, almost part two of this is the imperative to invest in our more sophisticated range of munitions, JASM, LRASM, the more sophisticated air-to-air -air and dual-world air air-to-air, air-to-ground munitions that we see coming. Um, these are expensive often to start with. It's painful to put them into a budget at any time, particularly now, yet it's that munition that in the end does the job. It's like the tires on your car. That's the only thing that's in contact with the road. In the end, that munition is what is in contact with the adversary target. This is not an area that we can skimp. And do both of you agree that in the past we have been short munitions, but we have had the luxury, as I think Dr. Grant, you mentioned, to ramp those up because of the adversaries we were facing. But in a um, near competitor situation, we would not have that luxury. Um, and, and if that you do agree with that, where do you see this budget taking us in terms of the munitions gap? Well, the uh, focus and emphasis on the part of the Navy, of course, is replacing old ships and older aircraft. Uh, and with the BCA and then the uh, uh, BBA, the funding to reach down and replace those munitions and restore the kinds of advanced munitions that Dr. Grant addressed uh, is the money's not there. Uh, they're doing it with some development areas. I, I'll tell you, uh, I've had this discussion. I know the uh, fleet commanders have been straightforward about wanting to get some decent surface-to-surface -surface, uh, missile capability on the LCS. There is some obvious missiles that can be put on that ship uh, in the near term, and the Navy needs to get off the dime and get on with it. Uh, Hellfire is a perfect example of a missile that Navy has in its inventory. The Army literally has thousands of them. The Navy puts them on their seaborne helicopters today. Uh, I think that some sort of uh, missile system and an anti-air capability on the LCS would go a long way to having the fleet commanders uh, better embrace that ship. Uh, that can be done quickly certainly much more quickly than it's doing, being done today. Good. Dr. Graham. Well, I agree. I, I think this budget may not have looked carefully enough at what we really need to prepare for a peer threat. It's something we're all hoping won't happen, but we this is the defense planning cycle. We must look for capacity. And this is true, again, with munitions. Um, it's very tempting to cut or stretch or delay. Uh, a lot of early munitions work is done in basic research accounts or in, in, in classified programs where it's hard to look at what's truly going on. But I think we see this temptation to, to stretch and skimp. We're all hoping not to have to use these things. But, you, but unless you have that capacity, um, then the purchase of the platforms is, you know, it's, why did you do it anyway? So, and this is something that's easy to get right. It's easy to get the munitions inventory correct. Uh, we hear all the time that you don't want to be Winchester in this environment. And it's easy to prevent that. Um, so I think we need to continue the investment both in getting the correct inventories, positioning them correctly, and in the advanced, the suite of advanced munitions for a range of platforms and services. Thank you. And I'd like to recognize Congressman McIntyre for any questions he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again to our witnesses. Uh, Admiral Natter, on pages three and four of your testimony, and then you also just orally referred to the concern about the Air Force care, I mean, sorry, the aircraft carrier uh, force structure being reduced in the Navy with the current proposal. 
if this happens, and I think we are in agreement with you, we do not want it to happen, but um, if it were to happen, how would we mitigate, would you recommend, the shortfall in our day-to-day -day presence overseas? I know it's about, all about force projection, and with the concern of, of losing one of our carriers, uh, such as the USS George Washington, what would you see we could do to mitigate that loss? Well, the, the loss of that carrier would result primarily in the ability to flow forces uh, beyond the two-carrier presence that the CNO is providing the uh, theater commanders. In the case of uh, Pacific Command, we have the forward deployed carrier that is generally available uh, on short notice. Uh, we also have one always deployed out in that theater or over in the Central Command Theater that can flow quickly into the Pacific Command Theater if required. The challenge will be the flow of additional carriers into the theater should a contingency uh, erupt in North Korea with respect to the islands or with respect to any incident in the South China Sea. Today, the Navy is able to flow three carriers in addition to the two uh, in theater. That won't be an option should we go down to 10 carriers. Uh, so that's going to be the shortcoming. The reality is, in order to provide a carrier's worth of aircraft strike capability 24 hours a day, you need two decks to do that for any extended period of time because flight deck crews, pilots, ships need to sleep occasionally. And so with a two-carrier capability providing one 24-hour uh, cycle of assets, that's not sufficient firepower with the kinds of challenges that we're talking about in the Pacific theater. So there's going to be an obvious and uh, I think a negative impact on our ability to provide uh, the forces necessary that this nation depends on. Yes, sir. I, I agree with you. Now, also uh, on page five of your testimony, you refer to the 52 ship smaller surface combatant requirements. Um, and in looking at your comments there, you talk about the um, unmatched capability that we need to have with the LCS program, uh, but it does not mean you say that every ship needs to possess 360-degree uh, defense and offense supremacy. So is your recommendation that if we are under, and I know the uh, DOD has given some instructions about this uh, with regard to littoral combat ships, that modification or making sure that we keep the same number, if at all possible, but just uh, making modifications on the ships themselves if we do not have the, the financial wherewithal to do what we'd like to do, ideally on all 52 of them. Yes, sir. As I uh, testified just a few minutes ago, I think there needs to be some surface uh, right. and surface-to-air capability on those ships yesterday. Uh, I think that can be done quickly and ought to be. Uh, these ships are necessary for the Navy to fulfill its mission in things like anti-piracy patrols, they're going to be a far superior ship for the mine warfare mission. I was on a mine sweeper as an incident in JG, and I can tell you that the ability to, to sustain mine warfare operations for a long period of time is going to be much more capable on the LCS than it ever thought of being on its predecessor mine warfare ships. It also will deliver some significant ASW capability. So for the level zero, level one contingency kinds of uh, requirements of our uh, combatant commanders today, these are good ships. And they're going to grow and they're going to be better uh, as technology comes in. Uh, the alternative, of course, is to have even fewer ships to be able to deploy to the combatant commanders for things like anti-piracy, for things like mine warfare and ASW and working with our allies and friends in uh, the Southeast Asia theater. These are perfect ships for that theater. So I support the uh, ship. I'd like to see a little more uh, kill power on them. All right. Th thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Grant, just uh, in quickly in the few moments I have left, the um, Air Force, of course, as you have, have well cited in your testimony orally and written, is cutting hundreds of aircraft in the five-year budget plan. Um, in terms of future technology, do you think the Air Force is investing in the right things, and do you think that the claim of the Air Force to be cutting these aircraft because it wants to protect its top three programs, the 
new F-35, the new bomber, and the KC-46 tanker are the proper priorities with the limited sources of funding available? Yes, Congressman, I, I think that is their intent. I think they are trying to cut in order to reach a force structure of the future. The question, though, is, is the risk of executing that plan, and I will be more comfortable uh, with uh, taking the lump of the cuts when I see that, uh, that the funding for those top priorities is, is really stable in there and that they're procuring them in the quantities required. So I, I share a little bit of a wait and see concern, but I think that at this point in time, um, while there are many cuts on this, on this map of the U.S. that make me cringe uh, and uh, where I think, oh, I would cut, but I, maybe I wouldn't have cut that particular right. unit, I right. think overall I, um, this could be the right step as long as it's done carefully. You asked about future technology investment and mentioned earlier directed energy and some other things. I think these are absolutely vital. We have, uh, in the past few years, have seen advances in hypersonics and directed energy in particular and some other aspects of electronic warfare that um, have really made breakthroughs that we've looked for for a long time. And I would like to see these continued. I applaud the Air Force's investment in um, adaptive engine technology, which is long and complicated, but absolutely essential to next generation combat aircraft and to more rapid response through that advanced engine technology. I cannot stress enough, too, that it is those advanced engines that our US companies make that truly separate us from our competitors. So I hope this committee will, will look carefully to make sure that we are continuing the investments. Uh, something like directed energy, which in fact the Navy is deploying uh, this summer uh, on a ship, is um, this sort of thing has the potential to be quite revolutionary, both in defensive, as a defensive and as an offensive weapon system. And I would like to see the Air Force encouraged to continue its uh, thoughts and experiments as to how directed energy and other advanced technologies go on both its current and its future platforms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Courtney is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and I thank the witnesses uh, for their very powerful testimony. Um, you know, I think it's important sometimes to remember the Budget Control Act is not like we're helpless in front of it and, and sequestration to boot. Um, the, the historical precedent of sequestration in the 90s and early 2000s when Congress came together on a bipartisan basis with a balanced a uh, package of deficit reduction turned off um, those chainsaws that were put into place uh, with Graham Rudman. And if you, t you know, look at Graham Rudman's own words at the time, I mean, that was exactly the intended purpose. It was not to actually have those uh, mechanisms actually go into effect. But, you know, sometimes I think we need to be reminded of what the damage will be, and that's what certainly your very outstanding testimony today is going to hopefully point this Congress in that direction. Um, Admiral, I want to, first of all, Thank you for your comments on page five about the uh, um, Navy's uh, investment and in modernization of the cruisers and three amphibious ships. I think uh, the chairman deserves some credit for uh, sort of resisting the uh, push to totally retire those cruisers in past years. And, and I think we've actually found a better, smarter way to sort of deal with this issue. And, I, and your, your input, I think, is very um, constructive in, in that score. Uh, earlier in your testimony, you talk again about the uh, 600-pound gorilla that's sitting out there with SSBNX. And um, again, this came up with Secretary Hagel last week and this morning uh, with uh, the Secretary of Navy and, and Admiral Greenert. Um, you know, it's not that far off that we're looking at uh, the bulge that uh, production is going to cause to the budget. And uh, I mean, you mentioned sort of external assistance to the Navy's budget as a solution to it. Uh, maybe you want to talk about that a little bit more in terms of whether it's a separate account or whether we just enlarge the Navy's uh, piece of the pie. Uh, well, I'd take either option, sir. <laughs> uh, but the reality is this is a strategic national asset that is absolutely essential to the survival of this country. It needs to be put on a, on a side, I know the Navy has said it's absolutely essential. It's the baseline of their sand chart that says you cut other things before you cut the Ohio replacement. I agree with that. We can't afford not to fund Ohio replacement. The reality, though, is it's about $6 billion a year for about 13 years in the SCN budget, which today is only between 11 and $14 billion. So if you... If the administration and the Congress insist on funding it out of the SCN account, then you start 
picking shipyards to close down that are currently engaged in building amphibious ships, uh, destroyers, cruisers, uh, the submarine, the SSNs will go down in numbers. Something's got to give here. Uh, my take on it is this is a national requirement and it ought to be funded in some way other than through the Navy's SCN line. That's up to Congress. They're, you're a lot smarter than I am on that, but that's my going in proposition, sir. Well, thank you for the compliment. I'm not sure all of us would uh, uh, regard you. I think your, your testimony is very helpful, and um, you know, I think that's really uh, you know, an important mission for the Sea Power Subcommittee to, to really start um, addressing now. So thank you for, your, for being here today. Thank you, Joe. And um, as I indicated to both witnesses beforehand, this is the time we'd like to see if there's anything we've left out, anything you need to clarify, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to do that for the record. And, uh, Admiral, as you begin that um, statement, if you could follow up on what uh, Joe just mentioned about the cruisers, tell us why the cruisers are important. What do they do and why it's in, in important that we have those cruisers? Yes, sir. I'm glad you asked the question. I was commanding officer of one of those cruisers, not the 11, but a cruiser. Um, the reality is that uh, the DDGs and the cruisers have comparable uh, surface-to-air and uh, anti-air capability, different capabilities, but the cruisers are older. The, the value of the cruisers, of course, is that if you update them, upgrade them, and ensure the HM&E uh, is long-lasting, it will go with the carrier. It has a uh, much larger combat space where you can put uh, what we refer to as the Air Defense Commander or Alpha Whiskey to coordinate the air defense uh, around the carrier and around the battle group. That's essential. You've got to have someone looking out for the entire problem rather than just the, the, the ship's own uh, self-defense and missile defense. So that's a great value of, of these assets. The challenge on the part of the Navy is the top line. Uh, they didn't want to put these ships away. They need the force levels to satisfy the combatant commanders. And so this is not their idea. They have to satisfy that top line and stay within the budget constraints. And this is an innovative way, I think, to do that and still have these assets available if there's a national emergency, you can certainly bring those back into the force much faster than you can build a new ship. Uh, I would like to see something a little more gradual so that you're not putting them all at the end of the train, but I can understand the Navy's rationale for doing that. This is strictly a matter of trade-offs. What do you roll out in order to satisfy the top line? I can tell you that the cruisers may not be the last ships that have to go through this kind of an approach. Primarily, again, because if we stay at the BCA levels, all bets are off on all this. The cruisers, the carrier, you name it. And then you fold on top of that the uh, Ohio class replacement, and the Navy as we know it today isn't going to exist any longer. Admiral, could you tell us for the record exactly what cruisers do in terms of their muscle? And what would be the impact to the Navy of losing 11 cruisers? Well, 11 cruisers, in addition to the significant uh, air defense capability, being able to fire a good number of missiles out to protect not only themselves, but also the amphibious uh, ready group, the uh, carrier battle group, also has the ability to launch some significant numbers of Tomahawk missiles. They've been used in prior engagements. They've been very valuable in that regard. If you don't have those 11 cruisers, then you're going to have to cycle DDGs more frequently on deployment in order to satisfy the requirements of those Tomahawks, of those uh, air defense uh, missile assets, uh, the presence. The, I think we've all seen the movie, or many of us have seen the movie about the SS Alabama and Captain Phillips. None of that is even remotely possible without ships on station, conventional U.S. Navy ships that the SEALs went aboard and operated from. Without some capable asset out there, none of that's possible. So we as a nation can forget about it. 
we can forget about putting off these pirates, getting them under control. Uh, and that'll affect the sea lines, that'll affect the economy, that'll affect the markets. Dr. Grant? Thank you. Um, just three points. First, um, help hold the Air Force to its air dominance mission so that it acquires uh, the jets and the munitions and funds the correct training to keep up this vitally important mission. Um, second, if I may uh, jump into Admiral Natter's area, perhaps, and make a comment quickly about carriers. It was tempting to shave a carrier off when we looked at them primarily for as extra bomb droppers in permissive airspace. Carriers going forward will provide not just extra bombs on target, but air dominance, additional surveillance, tactical relay and communications, missions we have rarely tapped them for at the level we may have to in the Pacific. Recall that in 2001, when Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan began, four carriers were sent, three provided air superiority, the fourth was stripped of its air wings, save for a few F-18s, and stuffed with a lot of funny-looking black army special ops helicopters. So a carrier's an airfield of amazing flexibility. This is no time to be talking about getting rid of aircraft carriers. Third and final point, if I may say, this is about our two strategic programs coming up. One, of course, is the Ohio Quest, and the other is the Long Range Strike Bomber. I think we ought to, as a nation, look at both of them as important strategic programs and consider whether they should not both be funded in a manner that is separate from the other ship buying, and aircraft buying accounts of the day. This was, in fact, the case with both Freedom Class when it was procured in the 1960s and with, uh, with Ohio Class when it was procured in the 1980s. So SSB and X and LRS ought to both be looked at for what they truly are, that is incomparable strategic systems which no other service nor ally can duplicate. Thank you. We've been joined by um Mr. Longevine and Jim, do you have any questions? If so, I would like to recognize Mr. Longevine for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will submit my questions for the record, but uh, I thank Good. the witnesses for their testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we want to thank you both for being here today. Um, we certainly appreciate your expertise, but most important, importantly, your willingness to share it with this uh, committee. If we have no additional questions, then we're adjourned. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Check the box. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> Good Did, Good did yeah. Didn't want to be the skunk of the picnic with Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate <laughs> How are you there? Thank you for being here. Sorry I got in no, here so late. I, totally I, was a, I was at a hipsy hearing and uh, I was a bit well, sir, anyway. Thank you for coming in. You bet. Uh, I'll have some, probably some questions sir, for the record. Hey, Nick, I think the air conditioning just kicked off. Yeah, you can feel it. That's usually what
out here. Green Turf Fertilizers starting at $8.99 after $3 off instant savings with Ace Rewards Card. Ace is the